As parents of four boys, um, especially at younger ages, messes and clutter are like an everyday part of life, right? Uh, a daily occurrence. You know, we have the food that falls on the floor when the two-year-old eats, sometimes when the four-year-old eats, and sometimes when the seven-year-old, you know, it's, you know, it just kind of keeps going sometimes. But, uh, you know, they get better a little bit. So, and then we have the heaps of pillows and blankets and toys that are piled up in the, in, to create an epic fort in the playroom. And then uh, moving to a bedroom, you might find multiple sets of clothes that are on the bed and under the bed and, and on the dresser. And you're like, are these clean? Are you, did you wear these? Did you not wear them? And you're like, I don't know. You know, and you're like, come on, man, you know, put your stuff away. What's going on, you know? Um, and, uh, you know, just this week, uh, we, um, our two-year-old discovered markers, <laughs> you know? It was a great discovery, a grand discovery. And, and, and Big Brother loves markers, all sorts of colors, and he does great art, you know? I mean, and, uh, you know, he'll talk with you about it, and he'll draw you something if you want him to, you know? For a fee, for missions, he'll draw you something, right? <laughs> so listen, you know, let's just say magic erasers really are magic. And uh, when, when magic erasers don't work, rubbing alcohol can also do the trick, right? So... You know, now that our kids are, they're learning and growing and, and we clean up and we pick up after them and they're, they're getting better, right? But every parent knows the feeling of walking into a room that has been uh, rearranged, to put, it, <laughs> to put it politely, rearranged or trashed and uh, saying, you guys need to clean this up, okay? You know, what's going on? You guys need to clean this up. And then every parent who has more than one child also uh, knows exactly what comes next. But, but I didn't make the mess. I, I didn't do that. It wasn't me. It was somebody else, right? And then as parents do, they say, well, neither did I, but somebody's got to clean it, right? And then the astute older sibling uh, might then retort, but you did make the younger siblings that did make the mess, oh. you know? <laughs> but our, we have wise children, so they would never say such a thing. <laughs> you know, Listen, we all have messes in our lives. We all have things that get out of hand. We all have things that are not where they should be. Um, and that's why we're going to be talking for the next few weeks about spring cleaning, okay? We celebrated Easter last week. Jesus is alive. We know that because he's alive, our lives can change. But how many of you know that just having the hope that our lives can change doesn't mean that our lives don't still have big messes in them, right? Right? And uh, in fact, it doesn't mean that your life is not a complete mess, an absolute wreck, a travesty, a tragedy. Okay, I'll stop. <laughs> Listen, I, I think one of the biggest challenges that we face as we're trying to stare down this mess in our lives is the same challenge that our kids face when they are confronted with a rearranged room that needs to be cleaned. The biggest challenge in cleaning up is that we don't want to take responsibility for the mess. <laughs> you know, it's like, well, it's not really my mess. I mean, I don't, you know, uh, it, it could be somebody else. Now, listen, do other people make messes that affect us? Very much so, all the time. You know, we can deal with lots of obstacles in our lives that are brought about by other people's failures, uh, sins, to put them clearly, and uh, they really aren't our fault. But sometimes, even when we really do make the mess, uh, we still want to blame it on somebody because it, it's easier to blame the bad things we do on other people and then take the credit for the good things we do. You know, it's like if I did something bad, you probably made me do it. You know, you really made me mad, and so I, that's why I did it. But if I do something good, it came from the, the generosity of my own heart, right? <laughs> you know, it's because I'm just a good person. You know, we always have an endless number of excuses for why things are the way they are. You know, I've heard it said this way, you know, we judge other people by their actions, but we judge ourselves by our intentions. Uh, you know, we know that we're doing the best we can, and so we give ourselves a pass. <laughs> but the problem with uh, this kind of avoidance of responsibility is that if we're doing the best that we can, and things really aren't our fault, then we have no ability to clean them up. And sometimes as Christians, we even spiritualize it, <laughs> okay? We spiritualize it. We might say things like, I'm just in a season of waiting on God, okay? <laughs> now listen, <laughs> I need God to come through for me. You know, nothing's perfect until we get to heaven. Uh, you know, I guess this is just my cross to bear or the thorn in my side. 
I don't know why this thing keeps stopping every once in a while, but it's, okay, it's going to be all right. <laughs> you know, the crazy thing is, is that all these things that I just said can be true, right? They can all be true. We could be in a season of waiting on God, all those sorts of things. When it comes to actions that you are taking that are creating problems in your life, actions you're taking, these things are never true. <laughs> there are actions you are taking that are creating problems in your life. Your temper is not your cross to bear. It's your sin to crucify, right? <laughs> you know, and, and it may be creating a lot of messes in your life. You may be waiting on God when, when God is waiting on you to do what he's told you to do in Scripture. Listen, you know, nothing may be perfect until heaven, but the Holy Sh Spirit should be working in you to perfect you, okay? So it's not perfect, but he should be perfecting, right? We should be going from glory to glory, from grace to grace. You know, God loves us when our lives are a mess, just like we love our children. You know, marker all over everything. Listen, buddy, you're so cute, but listen, you can't do that, you know? <laughs> and, uh, you know, he saves us when we're a mess, right? He rescues us and helps us, and he forgives our mess, but he doesn't want us to stay a mess. Amen? He doesn't want us to stay a mess. And so the first step to cleaning up an area of our lives is recognizing that it's our mess to clean. That may sound counterintuitive to grace. Okay, we're going to get there. But listen, we have to recognize that this is our mess to clean. It doesn't mean we do all the cleaning ourselves. We need God's help to change us, right? We need God's help uh, to clean us. But like 12-step programs have so, uh, you know, succinctly put, the first step to getting help is what? Admitting you have a problem. Admitting you have a problem, right? And maybe I maybe that's a second step. I don't know. I just, you know, I'm not an expert on those things. But listen, we gotta admit we have a problem. Say it's my mess. It's my responsibility. And so with this in mind, let's see what Jesus had to say about our actions and what they should say about us. Let's see what Jesus had to say about this. Luke chapter 6, verse, starting in verse 43, says this. A good tree can't produce bad fruit, and a bad tree can't produce good fruit. A tree is identified by its fruit. Figs are never gathered from thorn bushes, and grapes are not picked from bramble bushes. A good person produces good things from the treasury of a good heart, and an evil person produces evil things from the treasury of an evil heart. What you say flows from what is in your heart. Let's take a minute to pray. Lord, we ask that you would speak to us this morning through your word. We ask that as we read scripture that your Holy Spirit would illuminate it to us. God, I pray that you would speak by your spirit to each person that's here. God, whether we've been believers for, you know, our whole lives, you know, 60 years, or, or, or whether, we're don't even, whether we're not believers, and we don't know if we put our, have put our faith in you yet. God, I pray that you would speak to each person, and God, that they would hear what you have for them to hear. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 So, as we study this, um, you might be distracted by the use of good person and evil person, right? You know, we might be able to think of a few people that we would describe as evil because of particularly evil actions that they have taken, right? Um, and we might think of some people as, you know, really good people because of some really good actions that they have taken. But for most of us, this passage might leave us a little torn. Um, I mean... I do produce some good things, right, by the grace of God. But sometimes I have also produced evil things or sinful things. Let's just put it that way. So am I a good person or am I an evil person? And I know I'm not alone in this uh, because we all have sinned, right? He who says he is without sin is a liar. That's what 1 John chapter 1 says of God is not in him. So we are also made in the image of God, 
right? And, and most of us have some desire, even before Christ, before we put our faith in Christ, we have some desire uh, to do our best to love people or do what is right, right? So, so we know that in all people, there is, because of the image of God in us, uh, there is some measure of good that is in us, but we know that it's been corrupted and marred by sin, and so we also have sin in us. We have the, these things that are in us to start with, right? And so then after Christ, he works in us to change us, and he, he changes our desires, and he makes us more like him, and hopefully we see more and more and more good fruit come out of our lives. And maybe this isn't true for you, but even as a believer, I sometimes still have ugly things that come out of my life. I'm, I, I hope I'm not alone. But, you know, I hope I, I, hope I am, actually. I hope you, hope you guys are, are, are perfectly sanctified. But listen, so what does Jesus say about this talk about good trees and bad trees? Okay? I believe he finishes up this, this statement that he's making in this section by telling us exactly his point. What you say flows from what is in your heart, right? And we could broaden this content because this context is about good and evil things, so it goes beyond even just what we say. And, and we could say this, what comes out of you comes from what is in you. What comes out of you comes from what is in you. Uh, or in other words, what you are producing is coming from your heart. The kind of environment that you are producing around you is coming from your heart. The things that are coming out of you are coming from your heart. And so Jesus is telling us to take responsibility for our words and actions. They are not just random based upon the kind of day that we're having, right? Well, I'm just having a bad day, and so that's why all that came out of me right? They're showing us something that's going on inside of us. It's like when I record a temperature of 102 on, on one of my kids, I don't just assume that the heat is turned up too high on the house or they were under a blanket for too long. I know that there's a virus or a bacteria inside of them, and the fever is just a symptom of what's going on inside. It's a fruit. It's a thing that is growing from a root. It is a thing that is growing from what it actually is. And this can be a tough realization to come to, uh, especially if you've gotten used to making a lot of excuses for why your life is the way that your life is. I'm a, I feel like I'm a little tougher today than I am sometimes. I hope you're okay. <laughs> Listen, but it really is for your own benefit that you recognize the truth of what Jesus is trying to say. Not that he's trying to say what he said. I didn't write trying to say in my notes. <laughs> Listen, do you have ugly words coming out of your mouth? That's a heart problem. It's a heart problem. Are you constantly anxious and fearful? That's a heart problem. Are you stuck in an addiction? That's a heart problem. Do you overeat, or overwork, or, or overspend? That's a heart problem. And whatever it is in your life, that you say, this is something that's going on in my life that is something you are doing, it comes from your heart because what we are flows from our heart. You get the idea, right? And, and so realizing this is actually to our benefit because if we know where the problem is, we know where to start cleaning up. <laughs> we know where, where we should be looking, how we can actually see things change. And, and see, because we might be tempted to just start cleaning up on the outside, right? And, and just try to fix a few, you know, behaviors here and there. See, Jesus had big problems with the religious leaders of his day and, and the, the, the people that taught the law uh, because they were all concerned about cleaning up behavior and mostly everyone else's behavior, right? Uh, but they totally ignored the heart. And Jesus speaks to them here in Matthew chapter 23, starting in verse 25. He says this, Woe to you, teachers of the law and Pharisees, you hypocrites, you clean the outside of the cup and dish, but inside they are greed and self-indulgence. Blind Pharisee, first clean the inside of the cup and dish, and then the outside will be clean also. Also will be clean. You see, 
if we're going to talk about getting clean and taking out the trash and clearing the clutter from our lives and all this kind of stuff that we're going to talk about in this series, we have to start by realizing where all this dirt and clutter really comes from, <laughs> okay? Where does it come from? It's, it comes from our hearts, right? I feel, I didn't hear what somebody said. I feel like somebody said it comes from my husband. I don't, was that what you said? No, I, no, you know, like, maybe in your house, you know? <laughs> but listen, you know, Jesus, Jesus says first clean the inside and then the outside will be clean, right? But this isn't something that we just have to do on our own. Jesus is telling the Pharisees, listen, He's not telling them, okay, you know how you used to make lots of laws about the outside? I want you to make lots of laws about your insides now. I want you to make lots of laws about how you think, and oh, you can't even think this way. Don't even think this way. You know, like, we have to follow the law here. And, and people do that with Jesus' teaching. They say, like, you know, like, Jesus said, listen, if you hate somebody, it's like murder. If you lust, it's like adultery. And so some Christians have taken that and said, well, now we must create new laws, you know, and, and Jesus's point is not we must create new laws. What he said is absolutely true in every way. But his point was not we must create new laws. It's you must have a new heart. Yeah. That, that's the point is that, that your desires must actually change. Your, your heart must change. You know, these religious leaders, they should have been familiar with the words of the prophet Ezekiel. This is what he said in Ezekiel 36 26. He said, I, this is the Lord speaking, I will give you a new heart and put a new spirit in you. I will remove from you your heart of stone and give you a heart of flesh. This is the promise of the new birth in the Old Testament. This is the promise of what being born again through faith in Jesus is is all about. And I, I want to I show you, there's two metaphors that are used through a scripture for a salvation. And there's more than two, but I want to kind of contrast a couple of them. You know, so we have this idea of being washed and cleaned, okay? Washed and cleaned from our sins, right? But we also have this idea of being replaced or being totally brand new. Like, it's like you're... Uh, you know, I'm going to give you a new heart. He didn't say I would like, you know, squeeze out the old one and rinse it out. He said, I'll give you a new heart. But we also have imagery of being washed and being cleansed, okay? So we have two images that do not contradict each other, but they complement each other. And, and so they're both important to understand, but I think one comes before the other in experiencing real freedom in our lives. And, and I want to tell you why I believe that. I believe that for Jesus to clean you from the inside out, you need a new identity inside, right? If Jesus is going to clean you from the inside out, you need a new identity. Because think about what often starts a new renovation project, okay? When are homes most often renovated? When they get new owners, right? You know, a house is, you see that house on your block, and it's like, oh my gosh, I hope somebody fixes up that house, you know, like, and you see the for sale sign go up, and you start to get hopeful. You're like, you know, maybe somebody's going to come that's going to take care of this place, you know, and, uh, <laughs> and, and then somebody, you know, hopefully comes, and then they can invest some money, and they can, they can change some things, and they can give that place a facelift. Listen, new ownership often brings about significant renovations. Something significant happens when you flip the keys, right? You know, there was a property developer in Anchorage, Alaska. Uh, and her name was Linda Dunnigan. And she had grown up with a mother. She'd grown up, had a rough childhood. She grew up with a mother uh, who had worked in a strip club, and, and that was how she earned money. And she had always felt a sense of shame about how her mother had earned money, and it was just something that she just, she just hated the industry. And, uh, but it was how her mother had felt that she'd had to provide for them. And so in Anchorage, uh, Alaska, there was a strip club that had recently uh, closed down. It had been shut down, and they were looking for someone to sell it to. And Linda was a Christian, and she was a, a, a property developer, and she wanted to see that club transformed into a church. 
She, she had it in her heart. She, the, to, she wanted to see that club transformed into a church. And so Linda purchased the building, and she began to transform the space. Uh, Pastor Kenny Menendez had lived in Oregon, and he'd worked in the aerospace industry. Uh, but he sensed a calling into ministry, and so Menendez moved his wife and their three children to Anchorage, Alaska. An open-door Baptist church was planted in 2020 in Anchorage, Alaska, in that same building that had been a strip. It was the same building, but it had a completely new identity right? Because it had new ownership. <laughs> it had new ownership. The purpose had changed. Even though it had a bad past, a new owner gave it a fresh start. Said, listen, forget all whatever that was back there. We're going to take all that stuff out. We're going to put some new stuff in. We're going to make this place look different. And the people who bought it, they didn't care what it used to be used for. They changed around every single room and every space to make it a place of worship and a place of proclamation of the gospel. And you see, that's what Jesus does with our hearts when we get saved. That, that's what he does. That's the new heart that he gives us. It's brand new because the ownership changes, right? It's brand new because the allegiance changes. And so there's a, a fresh set of desires. There's a, a fresh set of, of, uh, of priorities that come into our lives. But there's a lot of renovation and cleaning that still needs to take place, right? <laughs> and a lot of what needs to take place, listen, a lot of what needs to take place is in our mindsets. I'm going to read from 2 Corinthians chapter 5, starting in verse 15. It says, And he, Jesus, died for all so that those who live should no longer live for themselves, but for the one who died for them and was raised. From now on, then, we do not know anyone from a worldly perspective. Even if we have known Christ from a worldly perspective, yet now we no longer know him this way. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed away, and see, the new has come. And so many of us know this verse. And, and it's a message that we could proclaim every week. In fact, I hope in some way we do proclaim that message every week. If anyone's in Christ, he's a new creation. He's brand new. She's brand new. But I want to focus on the previous verse, the verse that comes before. It says, from now on then, we do not know anyone from a worldly perspective in verse 16. Even if we have known Christ from a worldly perspective, Yet now we no longer know him in this way. And so that word know actually means to understand or to discern or to judge or to think about. In other words, we have to change the way that we think about ourselves and others. If we have placed our faith in Christ, we have to change the way we think about ourselves and the way we think about others. And so when we talk about hearts being changed, there are multiple aspects to our hearts, okay? The first tr is the transformation of our hearts through faith in Jesus. We've talked about that. That's coming to faith in Jesus, and Jesus changes our ownership, changes our identity, and makes us brand new, brings us into the family of God. He gives us a new last name. You know what I mean? Adopts us in, brings us in. But the second way that our hearts change is a continuation and a product of the first. The first has to happen, and then the second continues to happen, right? You see, our hearts include our mind and our will and our emotions. And although our desires change when we come to Christ, we now have a desire to serve God, a desire to honor God. Often the mind part of our hearts hasn't gotten the message. <laughs> I don't know if you've ever had that problem. You know, we still think like we have dirty hearts. We still think like we want what we used to want. When Jesus is telling you, listen, I'm giving you a new heart. Why do you think that, that Scripture tells us in 2 Corinthians 
that if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old is gone and the new has come. Why does scripture tell us that? Because we might not know it, right? Why does scripture tell us? Because we might not know it. Scripture tells us and we preach it because we might not believe it. We might not understand it. We might not yet live it. You see, understanding who you are in Christ and what Christ has done for you is foundational for every other area of your spiritual growth. If you don't, if you don't get it, if you don't say, okay, this is what Christ has done for me, you won't experience the spiritual growth you're supposed to experience. See, you can't experience a new life if you still think you're the old you. You know, so as we walk through this series, as, as, we, as we talk about how we can uh, becoming clean, how we can clean up our lives, how we can take this season and, and do a, a spring cleaning in our lives, we can't just focus on the outside. We have to focus on the inside. Because I might be in, able to inspire you uh, to, uh, you know, to clear out your garbage or to, you know, to wash the outside of your cup, metaphorically. <laughs> but what's on the inside will always eventually come out again, right? If you haven't surrendered your life to God and you're still living in rebellion against him, that's going to demonstrate itself. You may be able to kind of, you know, fake it for a while and, well, I'm just trying to fit in with people and I'm just trying to, but listen, if you haven't surrendered your life to Christ, listen, if you're a young person here and you haven't surrendered your life to Christ, I've seen it. People will, will pass as Christians, pass as Christians until they get out of the house. And people, will, I don't know what happened. They were in church. They, I mean, they raised their hands and everything. You know, they were, they were, listen, you can pass as a Christian, but if you haven't surrendered your life, it doesn't stay. It doesn't stick. Listen, we have to surrender our lives to Christ and see him transform our lives. But you may be here and you may be a believer who has Jesus in your heart. Okay, Jesus is in your heart. You love him. You want to serve him but you also have some other false beliefs in your heart, right? And those things that you believe about who you are will also eventually come out of your heart because the things that are in your heart will eventually come out. If you believe that you're an angry person in your heart, even if you try not to be angry, it will come out in angry words and actions because that's who you believe that you are. If you believe you have to compete with other people to be worthy of love, it's going to come out in jealousy and gossip and in tearing other people down. I if you believe that you're unable to change your habits, I just, I just can't change my habits, it's just who I am, it's going to come out in addictive behavior. But see, God changes hearts. Not only does he give us new identities and change our, our ownership and, and, and uh, transform our, our last name, bring us into the family of God. Listen, he also changes what we believe about ourselves in our hearts if we let him. He also renews our minds. You see, Jesus can clean your whole heart. He can clean your whole heart, not just part of it, not just the identity part, not just change the title deed. He can actually clear all the other stuff out of there and give you a new purpose and a new identity, make your life look different. And, and that's the continuation from Easter. That's the continuation from Jesus is alive and he wants to continue to change you. Some of it happens immediately, right? And some of it happens over time. And, and so there may be some of us here who need to stop being content living in a mess. Maybe you've been living in a mess for too long and Jesus wants to clean your life. He wants to help you to change some things in your life. And, and, and the st first step to that is recognizing this is coming from my heart. It's coming from my heart. It's coming from things I believe in my heart. It's coming from, uh, from something that is inside and God wants to clean your whole heart. Let's take a minute and pray. 
Holy Spirit, we ask that you would speak again to us. God, we pray that you would pour your spirit out, God, as, as, as we sang, as we prayed. God, I, I ask, Lord, that you would, would minister through your Holy Spirit, God, and speak to each person. Speak to me, God. Speak the areas in my life that you want to clean, the, the mindsets that you want to change, God. And for every person that's hearing my voice, God, I pray that you would speak to them. You know, if you're here this morning, maybe you're here and you need to give your life to Christ. You have not put your faith in Christ. You still have, you're still the Lord of your life. <laughs> you're still saying, I'm going to decide what I'm going to do with my life. And Jesus wants to be Lord of your life. He wants to be your Savior. He wants to take you out of the path that you're on, which is a path of rebellion against God. And he wants to bring you into relationship with God. And so if you're here and you want to put your faith in what Jesus did for you to reconcile you with God on the cross, if you're here and you want to do that this morning for the first time, I just want you to raise your hand so I can pray with you. And we give this invitation every single Sunday. And I say that because I never want anybody to think that it's because they're here that I'm giving this invitation. Every Sunday we give this invitation because we want those who are away from God to come into relationship with him. So if that's you, just one more second, just raise your hand and I want to pray with you this morning. Now there are most of us here this morning, because I know many of you, there are most of us here this morning that we've given our lives to Christ. We've accepted Jesus as Savior. But I believe for many of us, there are areas in our lives that God wants to clean. And it starts with our hearts. So I want to lead us in a prayer this morning. And I don't usually do this. But I want to lead us in a prayer, kind of a salvation prayer. And I want us to repeat it together, okay? So I want us to repeat this prayer together uh, as we respond to what the Lord is saying in his word. Say, Dear Jesus, I give you my heart. I give you what I believe about myself. I give you my desires. I give you my emotions. Please clean me. Holy Spirit, work in my heart. I surrender to you. Amen. 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 This is, this is an ongoing conversation. This is an ongoing, we're going to continue to talk about these, some of these things. But this is really an introduction that helps us to say, listen, as we talk about cleaning up, it's not about washing the outside of the cup, is it? Right? It's not about impressing other people. It's not about changing our behavior. It's about God working in our lives so that we truly and really are free to follow him.